Welcome everyone to the Sully Meet and Greet for featuring your candidates for state senator and delegate. Now can everybody hear me? Everybody hear me? Fantastic. I also wanted to let you know that the Sully District Council Citizens Association is turning their meeting over to us so we can have this candidate forum with the voters. I'm Helen Kelly with the League of Women Voters of the Fairfax area and I will be your moderator. We are happy to have these co-sponsors for this event. The American Association of University Women of Virginia, the Fairfax County Council of PTAs, whose president Debbie Kilpatrick is with us tonight, and the Sully District Council of Citizens Association. We are all nonpartisan and nonprofit entities. So please check the tables for sponsor information flyers. The LWVFA and our co sponsors thank the candidates for taking this opportunity to meet with you. And candidate brochures should also be available if you're interested. We express our appreciation to Jim Southworth. Director of Technology Development at Fairfax Public Access Television for his time, talent, and expertise in videotaping this event and uploading it to YouTube. When the video is available on YouTube, we will post links on all sponsor websites. We also thank the staff of the Sully Government Center for their help in providing this venue and for helping us with setup. And we thank all the volunteers for their efforts in organizing this event. And we thank all of you for attending tonight. We look forward to a lively and respectful discussion of the issues. You'll find copies of some handouts on your chairs with the election information and contact information for local elected officials. We hope you'll find these useful. Also, Kurt Malkenhaupt with the Fairfax County Office of Elections is here with a, ta a tablet computer to do online voter registrations. So please make sure you're registered before November 3rd. Now here's the format for tonight. All candidates who were certified to appear on the November 3rd ballot were invited to participate. I will introduce each candidate who will then make a two minute timed statement. And, I, and in the order that their names appear on the ballot. Then I will start the questions. After the first question, we will start rotating the order in which the candidates answer your questions. Each response is one minute. And if you have questions, volunteers will pass out index cards, please. We ask that you keep the questions brief and specific, only one question per card, and please indicate whether your question is for a senator or a delegate. And the candidates have agreed to these rules, so let's get started. Okay. So, Senator Marston. What will you do to help Fairfax County build rail mass transit? Oh, right, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Forgot their, I forgot their opening statements. Each candidate gets a two-minute opening statement. Please begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Dave Marston, uh, candidate for the 37th District uh, in the State Senate, which stretches from the Prince William Loudoun County line all the way over to Lake Barcroft in Annandale. Uh, you know, there's a kind of a misconception out there these days about politics and, and the way we operate in legislatures is that nobody's getting along, nobody's getting anything done. And while there are things that we're never really going to agree on with the other side of the aisle uh, in, uh, in Richmond, there's a lot of things that we do agree on and that we can work on and make compromises around. Over the last three years, for instance, I worked on an Uber bill with uh, uh, Senator Mark Obenshane of the Shenandoah Valley to authorize Uber to operate in Virginia, but making it fair to the cab companies, keeping it on a, lay, a level playing field so that they can compete and, and one side wouldn't uh, be ascendant over the other. 
Uh, for several years in a row, I introduced bills with Delegate Jim LeMunion, who represents part of Sully here, to prioritize congestion relief as we do transportation planning in Virginia. Uh, too often, the, the decisions were made on, on political considerations, and we actually came up with a, a matrix of uh, decision making to determine what, what, uh, which projects will relieve the most congestion, because I think that's what our, 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 our constituents want here. And last year, uh, working with Delegate Dave Albo on, uh, on making cannabis oils that are non-psychoactive available to kids with intractable epilepsy. I worked on the medical part, he worked on the legal part, we got it done uh, with uh, tremend under uh, uh, some real headwinds. And, uh, but I've lived here in the county all my life, spent 30 years with our juvenile court, 17 running our juvenile detention center, and ran the Department of Juvenile Justice as acting director uh, under two governors. Uh, my only claim to fame in the legislature is I'm the, uh, uh, the only person ever elected to office who ran a state agency before he uh, got elected as opposed to after. And uh, it's been a real help to me. And it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for having this event tonight. I guess we're missing a couple of people. They got stuck in traffic. We hope to see them soon. Mr. Bolova, Delegate Bolova. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Bolova. Um, it's been a real privilege to, privilege to be able to represent the 37th District in the House of Delegates for the last 10 years. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the 37th District, it includes the city of Fairfax and then stretches out west along I-66. Uh, to Stone Road on the other side of Centerville. Uh, my wife and I both grew up in this community, and so when we settled down and decided to raise our family here, uh, we knew that we wanted to give back to the community that had given so much to us. Uh, so I served as the chair of the county's Consumer Protection Commission, uh, still serve on the Brain Injury Services Board of Trustees, um, got involved in, in scouting, uh, youth sports, and uh, both my wife and I started our Neighborhoods National uh, Night Out Against Crime program. And so is that same kind of civic pride uh, that I wanted to bring to the General Assembly. Uh, in the General Assembly, I've really tried to focus on the issues that matter the most to my constituents. And so I was very proud to support the bipartisan transportation plan uh, that is pumping billions into local transportation priorities. Uh, I sit on the House Education Committee, uh, where I've had a chance to work up front with reforming our, our standards of learning. And last year, I introduced uh, ethics reform bill, uh, and I was very pleased that my bill was incorporated into the final legislation that was ultimately passed by the General Assembly and signed by the governor. I've also had uh, the honor of being able to spearhead legislation on human trafficking, which I know is something that League of Women Voters cares very much about, uh, environmental issues, and also identity theft issues. Um, of course, my biggest responsibility is making sure that I involve my cons uh, constituents in the decision-making process. Uh, and I've done that through frequent town hall meetings and informal coffee hours. Uh, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us in Virginia. I'm looking forward to being part of that, uh, especially continuing to diversify our local economy, uh, as well as passing nonpartisan redistricting reform. And so I'm looking forward to some great questions tonight and pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Delegate Yee. Well, soon to be, but not yet. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good evening. My name is Sang Yi, and I'm running for the 37th House of Delegates District, which includes the entire city of Fairfax, where my wife Sarah and my da our daughter Evelyn lives, and the surrounding parts of the county. I want to begin by thanking everyone for being here today, especially our host, the League of Women Voters, the AAUW, Fairfax PTAs, the Zeta Phi Beta, Sully District Council, and especially my opponent, David Bulba. Uh, I think we're all here because we all appreciate how important this process is. So. Like many Virginians in Northern Virginia, I'm part of a growing demographic of immigrants. My family and I moved to the United States in the early 80s, and quite often, this is a story, but we came here with very little resource. And my father found work at a t-shirt factory, and my mother started working at a grocery store in a pretty bad part of town in Washington, D.C. Uh, over time, with hard work and prudent savings, they eventually became business owners themselves and truly embodied what we all come to know as the American dream. But what's important here is not that a pair of immigrants came to this country and came across some good fortune. What's important is that they instilled in me the spirit of hard work, especially at a time when hard work's often taken for granted these days. 
Uh, what's also important is that there, my family's story left me with a sense of gratitude, especially at a time when a lot of Americans, even Virginians, we forget how lucky we are to be here right now. So the seeds of hard work and gratitude really sparked for me my wanting to dedicate my life to public service. It's one of the reasons why I went to a service academy and got commissioned in the Navy Reserve. And I still serve as an officer in the Navy Reserve. I worked in the Defense Department as a civilian as well, and currently I'm a senior aide in uh, Capitol Hill. But you know, the problem right now is that uh, I'm running because it, we have, I'm deeply concerned about our community. I'm deeply concerned about our Commonwealth. We're, we're, we're hitting a lot of uh, slow recovery from this bad recession. And last year, Virginia saw 0% GDP growth. 47 other states, including the city of DC, has seen faster growth. That's not an ingredient for more American dream stories. That's why if I get elected, I plan to be more focused on quality of life issues where our roads are going to be moving again, our schools are going to be kept to be the best schools in the country, and we want to ensure that our government is accountable to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, Delegate Foles. Thank you. Uh, soon to be Delegate Foles. Thank you. <laughs> I am Jerry Foltz. I'm running for the House of Delegates in District 40, which includes parts of Springfield, West part of Springfield and South Sully and some precincts in Prince William County, North, I call it North Gainesville and North Haymarket. I'm uh, running as a Democrat and I can keep an open mind and work with others in the community to help solve problems and get things done. That's the way it's supposed to work. I'm a retired pastor in the United Church of Christ. I have worked in the communities where I've also served in the churches. I've helped start a nonprofit food co-op in one community. In another place, I started a Habitat uh, for Humanity chapter. And here in Centerville, my church, my wife, and other good-hearted people helped start the Centerville Immigration Forum, where we learned to appreciate uh, the diversity in our community and help build community. And then, lo and behold, we were challenged to start a labor resource center, which is now finishing its fourth year with 750 registered workers, 50 of them women. These are people that are off the street and uh, getting the pay that they uh, were promised. The ones left on the street sometimes don't get paid for the work they do, and that's unfortunate. I want to, I'm running because I want to see improvements uh, more than we are getting on uh, transportation and all the diversity and diverse ways that you can uh, have transportation, public transportation, rail, metro, uh, bus, and improve the highways, not just the main highway, 66 gets a lot of attention, but there's secondary roads, there's even neighborhood roads that get challenged by uh, people taking shortcuts like Stone Road close to where I live. I like to help, uh, uh, pr help protect women's uh, health choices that uh, we have in Virginia. I'd like to see Medicaid expansion uh, take place to help the people that need health care and help uh, also uh, our, our funds in Virginia. I'd like to see more support for our schools and not less so that we can uh, not have larger class sizes and the teachers feel supported. So those are the reasons I'm running and uh, there's much more. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Delegate Hugo. Hi, good evening. I'm Delegate Tim Hugo. I think I'm the most casual one here dressed today, but I'm out campaigning. Hey, I want to thank you. When, when y'all elected me about a dozen years ago, I literally was the most junior person in the Virginia House of Delegates. I was number 100. Uh, right now, I'm number three in the House leadership, and I try to use that to help our area here for the things that I think are important. And the things that, you know, some people like to work on getting wrapped up in a lot of the big issues. I think the things that I've tried to focus on most and heard from are the things that are closest to the people, things that we hear every day, whether it's stop signs, whether it's in Virginia Run, we've tried to work on some of the roads there and things there whether we've worked on stop signs, we put a new light in. But it's also issues that I think that people don't necessarily think are important or think of right away. David mentioned the, the sex trafficking. Over the last three or four years, I've worked on sex trafficking. It's been a huge issue that people don't think that happens in Northern Virginia. We passed, uh, my bill this year was, Virginia was the last state in the union to have a human trafficking law. And we passed that, I thought it was important. I've worked on autism. Autism is something that you see kids every day impacted that. I was the deciding vote on the Mandated Benefit Commission. It had been stopped up for years, but I thought it was important to get it out there, and it's something we did. We worked this year on the vets. We're getting a veteran, veteran center up here in Northern Virginia. It was something we put in the budget that we said it's important. We did two. There's going to be one up here and one down south, Hampton Roads. And then one more thing. It's, it's a little thing. We've talked about the diversity of the economy and, and our kids. One thing, too, that we've taken up, and I've taken up the last couple of years, is solar power. 
we've put bills in over the last couple of years that what we did is uh, uh, got rid of the tax on some of these new uh, solar power plants. I know David and I worked on a bill, uh, mine passed with David's help on creating a solar authority in Virginia. It's something that's important. I think there's a lot of issues that we have an opportunity to work on from the member of the House leadership uh, to number three in the House leadership to be on the commerce and labor, does all the business issues, the finance attacks. I look forward to working with you. I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate you guys having this event tonight. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Boisco. Thank you so much for the League of Women Voters for hosting us tonight. It's my pleasure to be here before you all. I'm Jennifer Boisco. I'm running for the House of Delegates in the 86th District. That's primarily the Herndon, Oak Hill, a little bit of Chantilly, and Sterling Park area. I ran for the seat two years ago. I came 32 votes short, and I decided um, that I'm ready to try it again. It's an open seat this year. To tell you a little bit about myself, I'm the daughter of an Episcopal priest and a nurse. My parents um, taught me a strong sense of social justice and of public service. I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked for a government relations firm. I understand how public policy works, and I really enjoy that. But I also in, have spent most of the past eight years working for Supervisor John Faust, our Drainsville supervisor, helping solve problems in the community working with HOAs, working with business owners, community leaders, our nonprofits, and our schools. I was uh, the key person as we uh, developed the, AP, the, the comprehensive plan for the area around the Innovation Metro Station. I worked with the landowners um, and with uh, the, the planners in Fairfax County, Loudoun County, the town of Herndon, the airport, and VDOT to make sure that we were creating a comprehensive plan that it will be transit-oriented development, multimodal, and some place that we can live, work, and play. I also worked closely with our school system. I was the education aide. That is my number one priority. When I go out and talk to voters, I hear about the concerns about school more than anything else. That is where I want to focus. I've been endorsed by both of the teachers' associations, the VEA and the Federation of Teachers. I hope to earn your vote for those of you who live here in the 86, and I thank you so much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Good evening. I want to thank the League for uh, hosting this tonight and all of you for attending. This is fantastic, and it's part of the democratic process, and I just love it. I want to eat it up. So I uh, appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, my name is Paul Brubaker. I'm the independent candidate in the 86th district, uh, running against uh, Jennifer and uh, Danny Vargas. I'm sorry Danny's not here. Uh, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, by way of background, I am a um, uh, reformed Republican. Uh, I ran 20 years ago with Tim. Uh, we, we, we promised everybody that we would re reform the bee poll tax, and that never happened. Just give me a, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm a uh, staunch Nonpartisan. I've been a presidential appointee in both the Democratic administration. I worked for President Clinton as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. And I worked for President Bush as the head of transportation research at the United States Department of Transportation. Um, I was a Capitol Hill staff director uh, where I worked with Democrats and Republicans to pass some really landmark uh, acquisition legislation and information technology legislation. Um, so why am I running? Because I hate sitting in traffic and I hate paying tolls. Those are the two main reasons. And I'm appalled at the lack of leadership in the area transportation in our community. Um, and I just want to caution Jennifer. I, I think you're running a great race. I want to commend you on that. But at the same time, I wouldn't ascribe to you know, an effective campaign the fact that you came within 32 votes of beating who I consider to be one of the most impotent legislators ever to serve in the Del House of Delegates, in Tom Rust. And I think you combine him with um, Frank Wolf, and they totally neglected the transportation infrastructure and things that they could have done to ease our commutes. We have the worst congestion in the country. It is such a dubious distinction. Um, and not only that, it costs a fortune. You shouldn't have to pay $400 a month to drive from Herndon to the Belt, or not Herndon, but Ashburn to the Beltway. And it costs 140 if you want to drive from Herndon to the Beltway every month, if you commute every day. That is nonsense, and we can do better. And as given my tra background in transportation, I aim to do that. Thank Your you. time is up. Thank you very much. All right, Senator Barker. 
Who did we forget? Marsden. Yeah. Marsden, sorry. Yeah. Is it uh, question time now? I yes, think. it is question time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Voter turnout is very low. What would you do to promote early voting or no excuse absentee voting? Well, this is a critical issue and most of these efforts in the legislature have failed, uh, mostly regrettably uh, uh, in committee. Uh, but the, uh, the, the issue here is one of making it easier for people to vote. I was a huge opponent against the uh, uh, the voter ID, the photo voter ID bill, uh, because it was, in my belief, uh, designed to keep people in inner cities who may no longer have needed or ever had a driver's license from getting the opportunity to vote. It was just putting impediments. We did not have, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a voter fraud problem. If there was any voter fraud going on at all, it was from state to state. I think there's only been a few documented cases of voter fraud, and we spent millions of dollars putting putting a photo voter ID into practice, and it's the wrong way to go. Uh, I will keep continuing to push bills to make it easier for people to vote early, uh, to make it easy for people to vote online, uh, by mail, uh, to make sure that we get our voter participation up here in the Commonwealth. Thank you. You can pass it to him. Okay. Delegate Bulova, what should the state's role be in determining the proportion of funding that should be returned to the uh, counties and cities? Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's a good, good question and kind of gets at the heart of, I think, an issue that a lot of us care about is that uh, you put anything through a funding formula that goes down to Richmond and we tend to get less than our fair share back. Um, for, for transportation, you know, we've worked very hard down in the General Assembly from a Northern Virginia standpoint uh, to get that money back. Um, part of that is because the Commonwealth Transportation Board is set up um, in, in a way that reflected really 1930s congressional districts. Uh, what Dele or, uh, Delegate Lemonian, uh, what Senator Marsden and the rest of us have done trying to make this uh, tied more to metrics in transportation I think is going to be a big help. Uh, the other part of this is education and we really do need to modify and change our local composite index. Uh, what we get back in Fairfax County and the city of Fairfax uh, does not reflect the reality of uh, how expensive it is to educate up here in Northern Virginia. That's something that uh, I've uh, co-patroned and worked on with uh, De uh, Delegate Vivian Watts before. And so those are the things that we need to do. Um, and again, that's something that I will continue to do if reelected. Thank you. Mr. Yi, work, workplace readiness, graduating employable students is key to economic development in the Commonwealth, what is the general, well I guess, um, what would you do in the General Assembly to address this key component of career technical education as well as general education? Well thank you for the question. Uh, I think that's a very important question, especially at a time when, you know, when I knock on doors in my neighborhood, in my community, we have so many parents who are concerned about college affordability and keeping our state students in state at our in-state schools. We have some wonderful universities and colleges in Virginia, and not enough of our students are getting to stay here. That's part of growing our economy internally and keeping them here, training them so that they can, they can work in our economy here. Uh, I also want to ensure that we have a lot more uh, encouragement towards the STEM and the H programs. Uh, those are the types of industries that we need to focus on. Technology is something that's great for us, especially here in Northern Virginia. We have a very uh, skilled workforce and we can and my opponent talked about you know, diversifying our economy. I think uh, technology jobs up here can really grow. So. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Foltz, do you su uh, suppo support or oppose Virginia's complying with uh, submitting a plan for cutting greenhouse gases as required under the, under the new EPA rules? Did you hear me? I heard you. I'm trying to, uh, to take it all in. It's a complicated okay. question. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me just say I'm in favor, certainly, of uh, whatever we can do to reduce uh, our greenhouse gases. Uh, it's a problem with our uh, pollution. It's a problem with uh, creating uh, climate change that's uh, hurting our, our communities and our, uh, our, our world, actually. Um, the Pope has certainly gone way out in helping us be aware of the need to take care of many different aspects, the uh, things that are affecting our climate and causing, uh, causing climate change. 
uh, and uh, hurting our environment. So I certainly am in favor of whatever it takes to, uh, to uh, control the greenhouse gases, that's for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Delegate Hugo. What will you do to um, help nonpartisan redistricting along at Virginia? How do you think redistricting will be resolved? Two things. One, I, I think right now, if you look at the, the bills that the districts that they're drawn now, the Senate drew, the Senate Democrats drew the Senate bill. The Republicans helped draw the, obviously drew the House bill. And, and then it went through the governor. I think right now that, that works. And I'm not in favor of the nonpartisan redistricting because I think it's a lot, it's a hard to do. And I think it's, you're always going to have somebody that has an opinion on this. I think right now the Constitution delegates it to the House and Senate and it's worked. And it's working. And it'll continue to work. Right now we're going through the court. But if you look at the bills that passed the House and Senate that these districts were drawn on, I think David voted for it. Senator Marsden voted for it. Every, the, the, when it came out of the House, I think it was 85 to 9. And when it came out of the Senate, every Democrat voted for it. So I think there's an opportunity there. I think we have to continue to work together. I think when you put Democrats and Republicans in a room together, they can come together on districts that are fair and decent. And I think we did, and I think we'll continue to. Thank you very much. Well, it appears that we are starting to run out of questions. So I'm going to ask you the same question. How would you help develop a plan for nonpartisan redistricting in Virginia? Thank you for the question. I support nonpartisan redistricting. Uh, Senator Cree Deeds has introduced legislation several times, which continues to fail. I think that when we have politicians creating their own districts, you're not looking out for the best interest of the community. And I think that's a shame. We look and see some of the shapes that they have created that there is no cohesion, there are separations. Uh, the courts have deemed this unconstitutional. And I believe that we need to pass it over to a nonpartisan appointed group. It has been deemed okay, uh, okay by a, a, the, judici the judicial system mm -hmm. and, um, and allow them to set the, the districts. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Brubaker. Yeah. Yeah, I fully support um, nonpartisan uh, districting. Look, the gerrymandering um, uh, in the United States has been around since you know, the beginning days of the Republic, and frankly, it's become a power game, uh, and it's an unfortunate power game. And you see it in play right now. I mean, there's a reason why the Republicans and the Democrats are throwing so much money into this race on both sides. Jennifer's taking a bunch of dough, Danny's taking a bunch of dough, and there's a reason why the Speaker of the House is dumping $50,000 into that race. And he arranged for another uh, $50,000 center of the race, plus some other dog and cat donations from the leadership. I don't know that I saw Tim's name in that list of donations yet, but maybe I did. No, I think I did, 500 bucks if I remember correctly. The point is this, it's a big money game, stakes are high, and the control of the Republic is at stake. We need nonpartisan redistricting. It is non-negotiable. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. Um, what will you do to work across the aisle to legislate the same revenue raising for counties, revenue raising privileges for counties that cities and towns now enjoy? Well, just to... Uh go over the, the basics of this. We are what's called a Dillon Rule state. So unless we authorize localities to raise a tax, for instance, they don't have the authority to do so. Now the results have been mixed. When we have given localities uh, the authority to tax, they very often haven't followed through uh, and then tend to blame us as to, as, to, you know, as to why we didn't do it for them. Uh, so it is a very, very, very complex uh, uh, issue around that. Uh, I do think that large counties, certainly uh, those uh, like Fairfax County in the, uh, uh, in the administrative structure in, in which we are uh, organized, uh, certainly does need greater flexibility to do things such as a meals tax, to do uh, transit occupancy taxes, 
to do things that would broaden their uh, revenue picture by keeping it thin. In other words, being able to cut the bee pole tax and other things and spread the, uh, the revenue picture, the taxing picture out so that it's broader and thinner and not, and not narrower and deeper. Delegate Bulova. Same question? Yeah, same question. Sure, great. Well, thank you. And that is a good question. And, you know, when we set up counties and cities in Virginia, of course, you gave them different taxing authority because there really was a big difference between cities and counties with respect to what they do. But if you take a look at what Fairfax County does versus Alexandria uh, versus any other big city, um, you know, they have those same kind of responsibilities. And so as Senator Marzen said, you know, it's not about raising more these days. It's about making sure that you have a broad uh, range of, of revenue sources. And what's happened in Fairfax County is that we over rely on the real property tax. And so, you know, that comes directly to us, people who own property. Uh, and so we do need to provide um, a, a wider range of revenue sources so that we can go ahead and spread that out and not be as vulnerable to ups and downs in the, uh, in the real property market. Thank you. Mr. Yee, same question. Well, um, for starters, I, I, I want to kind of touch on something um, that was mentioned earlier about the uh, Fairfax getting its fair share. We talk about education and talk, talk about the, sorry, talk about the local composite index. The local composite index, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at the numbers, about only about 20 some percent of our school budget is funded by the state dollars. On average, if you look across the Commonwealth, other school divisions have about 45 percent of their school budgets funded by the state dollars. If we talk about how, how we're going to get money back here and talk about locality adjustments and things like that. I think that's a very important conversation. So one of the things that I would like to do if I get elected into the House of Delegates is, as, a, as Delegate Bulova mentioned earlier about um, Delegate Watts and trying to reconfigure the LCI, I think that's very important. Uh, I would work very closely with our localities, especially our city council members in Fairfax and also our county board of supervisors in Fairfax to try to fi figure out what the right balance is. Thank you very much. Mr. Foltz. Thank you. Um, I agree with a lot that's already been said, especially by uh, Dave, uh, both Davids. <laughs> um, what I favor, I didn't hear it mentioned actually, is the, the opportunity for the taxpayers uh, in a referendum to make a decision for our own community about uh, extra taxes, such as uh, the uh, meals tax. Understand as much as half of the people that eat in our restaurants in Fairfax County come from outside of the county. So I don't mind them paying a little extra to the privilege of eating in Fairfax County and helping support our needs here. We have an urban police force, the biggest one in the state, uh, one of the biggest in the country, I suppose, outside of the, the major cities. And we need to be able to have our ability to pay for what we want and what we need here in uh, Fairfax County. And that's what I would uh, support. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Hugo. Yeah, well, let, let me be real clear. I think your question's premised on that we need more revenue. Yes. And the fact of the matter is I'm not voting to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to help rate Fairfax or any of the localities raise their taxes. I think people are taxed enough. I think if you look at it, we raise, we have a lot of revenue coming in. And I'm not, I'm going to be very clear and direct about it. Uh, if, it's, if the question is premised on getting more revenue out of the taxpayer to the county, to the government, I will not do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Boyska, same question. Sure. That's okay. What would you do to work across the aisle to get this to allow the same revenue raising privileges for counties that cities and towns in Virginia now enjoy? I would work across the aisle to um try to help our colleagues who are not living in Northern Virginia understand what burdens we are placed under here in Northern Virginia. We are a Dillon state and that's been around since the 1940s. I'm not suggesting that we change that. But Fairfax County is an urban, it is, you know, it's the most urban part of the, of the entire state. One of the reasons that people say, you know, when I go out and talk with voters and with business people, let's take the restaurant meals tax, for instance. It's not the actual meals tax that's the problem. It's the collecting of the tax. 
why don't we work with our technology companies to help them create a, a device to, uh, to, to bring in the money without it being a burden on our business owners so that it's a win-win proposition. I don't mind the extra 30 cents when I go out to lunch. I don't want to burden my business owner. Um, and I think we can find a, a solution. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Yeah, this is, um, this is where I think Jennifer and I are going to disagree a little bit. Um, but just as way of background, I forgot to mention that I'm also the Fairfax County President of the Grover Norquest Can Go to Hell Club. Um, because I don't believe you can ever will the ends without willing the means. And frankly, we've starved the transportation infrastructure of tax revenue, which is why I'm advocating a 3% increase in the gas tax. Let me say something about the Dillon Rule. The Dillon Rule is a relic of the 19th century. And frankly, we need to move more to a home rule state. We need to give local communities, push democracy closer to local communities so we can decide our own destiny. I want to see us to be able to dedicate very specific revenue streams to police, fire, teachers. It's why we, we were only able to pay teachers less than 1% increase in Fairfax County. It's horrible. But meanwhile, the supervisors give themselves a long overdue 27% increase in pay. I don't object to that. What I object to is the structure. And the structure is broken. And it needs to change. We need to move more toward home rule and give up this relic of the 19th century and the Dillon Rule. Thank you. All right, what specific measures would you take to relieve our transportation problem? Well, I think as, as, as most of you know, there are efforts going on right now to have a major uh, upgrading of Interstate 66. Uh, it is, uh, I have, uh, like Mr. Brubaker, I have issues with, with tolls. Uh, but at this point in time, unless we're willing to raise additional revenue for transportation, we're going to have to uh, rely on, uh, on, uh, on uh, drivers to, uh, uh, to pay uh, for some of the infrastructure changes that we're going to do on 66. We have made some progress with transit. An eighth of a cent that we passed on the transportation bill a few years ago is dedicated toward transit. We're two years away from a VRE station in Gainesville, which should relieve traffic on Interstate 66, which I know is, is very important to, uh, to folks out here. And the metrics I talked about earlier uh, that uh, prioritizes projects based on their ability to relieve congestion includes transit. So that's part of the mix that we're looking at. It, it isn't just roads. It also has to be transit when you're looking to solve these problems. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, and, and great question. And you know, you, you can't, um, you know, ro roads don't come for free. And so what we did in 2013 with new transportation revenue was extraordinarily important. And it's what's allowing us to move forward with uh, things like uh, Route 28 and unclogging other local bottlenecks, uh, also I-66. Uh, we also can't pave our way out of, out of our transportation problem. And so we absolutely need to invest in mass transit. We need to get Metro out to Centerville and then further out. We need to invest more in the technology to get more bang for our buck out of our existing infrastructure. Um, and so better timing of lights and modeling uh, to get people through sooner and quicker. Last but not least, though, is we really need to focus in on the nexus between transportation and land use planning. Uh, we need to make sure that those things are coordinated better uh, so that we're not recreating problems in the future so that future generations don't have to solve these transportation problems. My commute is an hour and 15 minutes each way. It's uh, 25 miles into DC, like probably so many other people in Northern Virginia, and it's absolutely miserable. And one of the things that I've learned recently uh, that the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Nick Donahue, proposed in Governor McCall's transportation plan is a $16 round trip toll on 66. There's some outside the Beltway into DC. That's I think it's $7 there and $9 back on peak hours. That's ridiculous. Uh, that is just completely not a commonsensical idea. It's not a workable solution for many families in Virginia. So, and I understand that, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong proponent of mass transit as well. And I love Metro. My wife and I, we've lived in DC before. We've, we lived and died by Metro, right? But at the same rate, going out to Centerville, Metro is a long, far away project. I want to think about solutions we can do now. We need to figure out where the bottlenecks are, and we need to start investing in those infrastructure points right then and there. We do, I agree, as Delegate Bulva said, you know, we need to use our technology to better time our lights, 
We need to also increase our teleworking policies here. Work with the federal government, work with the state government, work with, work with the private sector industry here and promote more telework and get these cars off the road. So I see my time's up, but yes. I, there's Thank obviously you. a lot more to talk about. Oh, yes. Thank you. Same question? Yeah. Thank you very much. I think the transportation challenges are a combination of things that uh, can offer us uh, options, whether it's um, extending Metro, which I'm certainly in favor of. I don't know how long it'll take, but we need to be working on it and get committed to it. Uh, actually, my district goes all the way out to through Prince William County, so I'm looking at Gainesville and Haymarket, actually, ultimately. Um, but I want to quickly say uh, an idea that came to me recently with terms of the tolls. I'm not keen about uh, tolls. I've paid enough of them. But since we've increased the uh, amount of money coming from our, our area here to help with transportation improvements, with technology such as it is, it shouldn't be too hard with our transponders to indicate when you're uh, on a toll lane that you're in this, uh, from this area and that only people who coming from outside, from west, say, Fauquier County, Warren County, whatever, on the toll roads would be the ones charged for it, but you're already paying for it with our taxes here. I think it's an idea that should be explored as far as I'm concerned. But I'd like to see VRE uh, extended out to Haymarket. That would relieve just a little bit. I'd like to see bike lanes put in, too. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Hugo. Well, when we come back, you know, I'm going to be the vice chair of the Transportation Committee, and I'm going to be appointed to the NVTA which spends the money, raises a lot of the money here in Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. I think the biggest project that we can work on is the 6628 interchange. It is the number one bottleneck in all of Northern Virginia. It's a $158 million project that people, the governor, have been sitting on right now. We need to do it now, right now. It re that reverberates from Arlington all the way out to Falkier. The fact of the matter is we could do that now, and we should focus on that right today. He talked to Sang, talked about the 66 project and the $16 tolls. Let me be real clear for everybody. It's $16 just inside the Beltway round trip. Then it's probably another seven or eight or 10 outside the Beltway. And, and there's no additional capacity. And looking at, I want y'all to look at this proposal. Go to transform66.org. Outside the Beltway, the proposal takes away general purpose lanes. So in places where you have four lanes, you'll have three. Take a look at that. It's big. That's not the way to do it. There's a lot of things. Let's start with 28 and 66. Thank you. Jeff, let me walk this down to you. I mean, I mean, very good. Your question was on funding, wasn't it? No, sir. Transportation. Can you repeat the question again, please? Sure. By the time it gets down to me, I've I, lost the. I understand, core of it. yes. So, what would you do? to help solve the local traffic congestion? Well, I spent, the past, I, spent, I spent five years working on that issue in the Dulles Corridor, actually. We worked with our community, making sure that the people who lived in the neighborhoods had a voice in it, as well as the landowners and the, the, the local um, government officials, to look at the plans, sit together, interjurisdictionally to make sure that we were all looking at the same map at the same time to talk about where the connections needed to be. We also worked to make a multimodal path, uh, multimodal transportation solutions with transit oriented development, making sure we had bus, pedestrian, and bike lanes. But to do all this, it's going to cost money, and we have to look at the way we're, 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 we're funding this. The toll roads, we are well overtaxed, and it is unfair. We need to look, again, I'm going to go back to the funding. We need to look at a gas tax. We need to look at indexing the gas tax, because when we are burdened with that here in the Dulles Corridor, it's completely unfair. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Yeah, this is where Jennifer and I agree. I mean, we've got to raise the gas tax, bottom line. We need money. And we're not going to just pretend that uh, the tolls are going to go away and we don't have to resource this stuff. We need to be real about this. We need real solutions. And multimodal is the way to go. And I got to tell you something. So having, I'm probably one of the more qualified people at this table to speak about this, having run research at the US Department of Transportation. I know this is, these issues inside and out. And what I'm going to tell you is that multimodal is the way to go. And we can build rail really quickly. But we've got to get relief from the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the environmental impact statements and all the bureaucratic bull that surrounds these products and getting them shovel ready. This stuff can happen quickly. I mean, frankly, we built the Empire State Building in 13 months, 
and we can't build a metro station in two, three, heck, we can't even replace escalators in two or three years. That's the other thing about metro is we've got to reform the management of metro. I know they're looking for a director right now. Um, nobody wants that job because it's grossly uh, under-resourced and they've got deferred maintenance like you can't believe. And we need to take this all holistically. There is good news. If you look at the 2040 transportation plan, it doesn't address it. But the reality is we're moving toward autonomous vehicles, platooning. There's all kinds of technology coming down the pike. And our state is ill-prepared for it because the legislators don't know what's, what's, what the future actually is going to look like. And I think it's a shame. Thank you. Actually, we're going to start changing the order in which you answer the questions. So. Delegate Bulova goes first this I time. I was off the hook. <laughs> we'll change the subject a little bit. Um, do you support changing the way local, the local composite index, the local comp, comp I guess it's composite index, and the way edu education funds are divided among school districts? Yeah, thank you, and, and a absolutely, and, and that's, that's something that I think all of us here would, would agree on is that the local composite index uh, does not do justice to places like Fairfax County and, and Fairfax City. And I'll give you a real specific example. That local composite index was actually developed when the leadership in the House of Delegates was run by Hampton Roads. And so the local composite index is basically your ability to pay. It's your revenue generating capacity. Do you know the one thing that is not included in the LCI is the hotel motel tax. And so you got places like Virginia Beach and Hampton Roads that rely a lot on that, but that's not included in their ability to pay. Um, and that really is a discredit to us. Uh, we, we desperately need to change that. Uh, it's, it's only fair to do that. Uh, we have, I think as a delegation, uh, tried very hard to, when we do put in new revenue for our schools, actually have it go around the transfer or the, the funding formula. Uh, and that way we actually can get more money than if it went through the LCI. Thank you. Mr. Yee. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier as well, you know, I, I, I would be very a strong proponent of changing the LCI. Um, part of this is, again, like I mentioned earlier, about 20% of our school budget comes from the state. Where does the rest of the 80%, where does that delta come from? That's local taxes. So we talk about not wanting to raise taxes, and I don't want to raise taxes. Uh, if I get elected to the House of Delegates, I will make sure that every single dollar the Richmond charges will be used properly and efficiently and effectively. So when we think about the 80% that's missing in that pie, I don't want it to come out of our local taxes by our local taxes having to go up. Our schools are very expensive up here. And you know, we're one of the uh, most expensive school districts in the country. So I think it's imperative that we change the LCI and get our fair share back. Thank you. Mr. Foles. Yes, thank you. I certainly also uh, would like to see the change uh, for that index. Uh, I think we're not getting the funds from the state that uh, we need to have. In addition to that, I believe the state uh, is not living up to its uh, obligations it already has with the money that was coming in from the lottery was supposed to supplement and add to the resources to our county. Instead, I think the state has withdrawn in, in proportion to the lottery income, and that's not really how it was intended. Uh, I think uh, the teachers in Fairfax County are at a great disadvantage over so many places in the country because the uh, differential between the cost of living and income puts Fairfax County very low down on the scale compared to elsewhere in the country. So I'm for changing the in index for us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, and the LCI and the formulas, let me make it clear, that's another reason not to raise your state taxes. Because the fact of the matter is once it goes through the Richmond formula, you get less of that back. So that's one thing else to... But David's absolutely right. We agree on that. We have tried to change the LCI over the years, and it, it's an interesting proposition. If you have a Fairfax member of the House or Senate make a recommendation on the LCI, it is like running a red flag in front of a bull. They are coming after you from the rest of the state. And it's not Democrats. It's not Republicans. It's everybody else except the people you see up here. It is one thing, one thing I've learned when I first got elected, somebody said, what surprised you about being in the, in the Virginia House? Because I'd been up like uh, Jennifer up on the Hill. They said, well, I said it was interesting. The rhythms are the same. What surprised me the most is how much the rest of the state dislikes Northern Virginia but hates Fairfax County and resents Fairfax. And that's the truth. Some of them they do. And that's why all of us have to work together to kind of break through that to make sure we can work with our colleagues downstate. But this is one, this is a tough nut to crack. We'll continue to try to do it. 
Uh, we're getting more money back. But like David said, we have to try to go around the formulas to make that happen. You're going to be last this time. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Boisco, would you like me to read the question again? No, I've got it. OK. <laughs> Education is the, the one issue that I am most passionate about. Um, and I definitely agree with everybody here on the table. We need to try to reformulate the LCI. Also, though, I'm going to bring up something else, another funding opportunity that we have. And I, I cannot believe that Virginia has not expanded Medicaid here in, in the state. We give up $5 million every single day that we don't expand. And in the General Assembly, the general fund pays for $1.7 billion in uh, health care costs that could be paid for by the federal grant. If we would accept Medicaid expansion, we would have that $1.7 billion to use on other things like education. And I think that's a big waste of time that we're not doing that. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Yeah, uh, oddly, another area where Jennifer and I agree, I would foot stomp the, the Medicaid uh, expansion because we're paying for it anyway, either directly or indirectly. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about, I, I want to, you know, the LCI is really an interesting debate, and it's, you know, the, 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 the reality that we're living in right now. And yeah, we need to adjust the formula, but we need something more important than that. We need this comprehensive tax reform. I'd like to see us really lower corporate income tax rates to zero. Um, because it spurs jobs and it creates more taxpayers and it's really good for the economy. Um, and, and then what I'd like to see is us to finally get rid of that B-poll tax that we've been promising for the last 20 years. And I remember Bill Howell basically saying, hey, you know, when we take over, we're going we're gonna to repeal it. It's never happened. So I'm about say do. It's an integrity issue, right? So if we say we're going to do something, we've got to do it. And I just feel like we need comprehensive tax reform. We need to introduce home rule, not necessarily completely abandon Dillon, but certainly allow a little bit of home rule um, so that localities have more control over their destiny. Thank you. Senator Marston. Thank you. I, I got bad news and good news on the LCI. The, the bad news is we don't have the votes to change it. I think Dave Albo did a survey one time. Tim, what was it, 60 some jurisdictions or 60 some? districts out of the 100 would be hurt by a change in the LCI and only 30-some uh, would be helped by it. So that's not likely to happen that way. What we can do, this is, a, this is a, 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 a pie with a consistent amount of money in it. In 2008, when our economy collapsed during the recession, all of a sudden, because of our housing price declines, the LCI started to favor us a little bit. We started to qualify for more money. But that meant it was coming at the expense of some of the poorest jurisdictions in the, in the state who were now having to pay more. Well, what happened is we held them harmless. Never am I going to do everything, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that that never happens again. If we live by the LCI, we die by the LCI. And if you're a poor jurisdiction and all of a sudden you have to pay more, too bad, you made the deal. We've paid the freight long enough. Uh, that's the deal. When next time we have a downturn, they're going to have to step up to the plate. Thank you. All right, we have another education-related question, and we'll start with you, Mr. Yee. Do you favor starting school in Fairfax County before Labor Day? I think that part of what, what we're talking about right now mm -hmm. is, you know, we want to make sure our students have a well-rounded education. Yes. We want to make sure that our students have ample time in the summer to go and do other activities, you know, get involved in their communities. Go to, I know for me, when I was a young kid in, in high school, my parents had me very active, very involved, you know, between Boy Scouts and, you know, I, I went to the um, American Legion's, uh, you know, activities and things like that. If you don't have a long summer break, you can't do those things. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of it. Uh, I think that our students in Fairfax are pretty well-rounded and get involved in a lot of activities, and we need to respect that for those families. So having a longer summer break is, is good, in my opinion. OK, thank you. Mr. Foltz. Uh, thank you. If I answer that personally, I would be glad to see uh, each uh, area decide for itself, sort of like home rule, each uh, school uh, area decide for itself when they would start school. That's my personal idea. Uh, it's not a high priority for me. I think it's pretty well established that the school starts after Labor Day. Um, so 
it's not like a, something I'm going to fight for as much as other things that I think are a higher priority. I think it's, like I said, it's been established. There needs to be some flexibility as we have when there's an um, a extra impact in some areas with snow or weather things that they, they can get waivers uh, in terms of the uh, days that they have to put in and that kind of thing and adjust their schedule. But uh, it really isn't just, just not a high priority for me because I think it's pretty well fixed. And so I'd okay, rather focus on other things. Yep. Mr. Hugo. Delegate Hugo. Well, you know, this is one I've changed my mind on. I grew up in Virginia Beach, and then they didn't, they liked it starting afterwards. Uh, but it is a high priority. It's a high priority for our students. It's a high priority for our teachers here. You know, I work with the, the Virginia Education Association, the Fairfax Education Association, Prince William. They've all endorsed me again uh, this year. And the teachers are the ones that say it's important. Because what they say is, you know, if we don't start early enough because the kids have to take the SOLs, they say that last month is in many ways wasted. Now, if any of you have kids, you know that. The teachers say, oh, gosh, the last month, we just really don't do anything. We need to start earlier so we can finish earlier. So this is one where I have to tell you, I've listened, and I see a couple people nodding their heads. Obviously, you've got kids in school or have had kids in school. This is one where I've changed my mind, listened to the teachers, listened to the parents, listened to the students, changed my mind because it is a high priority. I've voted for it uh, in the last few years to allow the localities to make that decision for themselves. Thank you. Ms. Boisco. This is one where Mr. Hugo and I are going to agree. I'm a mother of two daughters. My youngest just graduated this past spring. If a kid is taking AP classes, those, those AP classes are set nationally. You don't have any flexibility whatsoever. And so the students are missing a good three weeks of preparation time to be ready for those. They can get college credit for these classes. Once they take those tests, school is done for them. And it is a, a complete wasteland. I remember having arguments with my daughters saying, you, you still have to go to school. And they said, no, we don't. The teachers told us not to come. It's a huge waste. We are spending tax dollars keeping those schools open for that last month. It's a waste for the teachers. It's a waste for the kids. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of the bus driver's time. It's a waste of everyone's time. We need to be able to set that time for ourselves. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Yep. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I want to elevate the conversation just a little bit in terms of um, what the data tells you. Uh, and I think it's really important that we make data informed decisions uh, when it comes to 21st century schools. And if it tells us that it's more effective to start school earlier than we do it. And I hear anecdotal things, but I want to hear, I want to I don't want to know what the data tells us. Um, because I'm looking at some of the data and the data tells us that, you know, maybe schools should be uh, uh, maybe function a little differently, um, both in terms of the length of the school day uh, and the terms during the year. And I'm not saying that we, you know, totally blow up our system, but look, let's be honest, the way the schools are structured today in the school calendar, it's agrarian in nature. Uh, we went through the agriculture age, the industrial age, now we're in the information age, and we need a s approach to the school schedule and the school day that reflects the information age and reflects the data and reflects how people actually learn. And I would also just add that I think teachers really should be paid year round because they're never really off. Thank you. Okay, here's the politics of the King's Dominion rule, which requires us to start school after Labor Day. Uh, it's based on ocean temperatures. If we started uh, school earlier, uh, that means that the Virginia Beach area would have to rely on uh, business coming in June, which they will not do because the ocean temperatures aren't cold enough to bring people down from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, or from wherever uh, to use the beach. So what you're doing, if you allow for the choice uh, for localities to do this, which I'm in favor of, but the reason they're not going to do it is it pits the school board, who is likely to be in favor of it, against the Chamber of Commerce, who's dead set against it because they need students doing the work uh, at the beach and at the venues in Tidewater uh, to be able to support the local economy. So that's why they resist doing this. Uh, and 
it's the one time where, where local choice really creates a problem. And that's why delegates and senators don't vote for it, because they do not want to pit their school board against the Chamber of Commerce or the Board of Supervisors or the, or the uh, City Council, because it is, a, it is a really difficult thing. What we allow for now is exemptions based on numbers of snow days and some other things. So there are jurisdictions in Virginia, probably about 30, 40 percent of them, that uh, already don't have to be involved in it. Thank you. Delegate Bola. Great. Thank you very much. And I've got three, three children, two of which are still in public schools and, and one that just uh, headed off to the College of William and Mary. And uh, this is an issue that we debate around the, the, ki the kitchen table. Um, you know, and the thing is, is that there are some very good reasons why you would want to start school before Labor Day. And, and I've experienced the exact same thing as Delegate Hugo said. Um, you know, this also relates to the fact that we so over rely on standardized testing. Um, but, you know, your kids are exhausted and you wind up having a lot of wasted downtime. The, the, the simple fact is that it comes to the matter of who is in the best position to decide. We elect our school board members here in Fairfax County and the city of Fairfax. And so we ought to provide that responsibility to them to decide what is in the best interest of our children. And if we don't like it, we hold them accountable. Uh, but that's a decision that ought to be held by our local school boards. And they can answer to the parents with whatever decision they decide. Thank you. Are you ready, Jane? All right, we have time for one more question. Very quickly. Okay. Voter, voter turnout is very low. What would, you do, what would you do to promote early voting and no excuse absentee voting? What, not all answered okay. it. You, okay. that, that it? Yeah. There's a lot we can do. Uh, I think the voter ID, a photo ID uh, was not necessary. That's a one little thing that uh, could be eliminated. Uh, I believe. Everything can't necessarily need to be done by laws. I think there's a lot of uh, conversation that could go on, a lot of talking to businesses and the community to see if uh, more people could be uh, let uh, have a, a short leave to go to vote in the middle of the day. Wouldn't that be appealing to people that are actually nearby um, and not have to wait till the crowds after, after voting time? I think there just needs to be more conversation with alternatives to help people uh, vote. Um, and make it more appealing and let people know for sure that uh, they can uh, vote early, that they can vote absentee, it's actually legally called. Uh, they can vote at the curb. More and more people are realizing that and I've helped people do that. There's a lot of things we can do to get the word out about how you can vote in many different ways and get them there. Uh, more turnout, hopefully okay. make it appealing. Thank you. Um, is it time to do Okay, real quick. <laughs> well, one. You're doing it. You're having this tonight. It's good. You're reminding people there's an election. It's amazing to me. So many people don't know there's an election. If you ask your neighbors, how many people, I, I've taught, oh, when are you up for election again? Well, no, 45 days, 43, 43 days now. They don't, we have an election in Virginia? Oh, yeah. Most people don't know it. So you're doing it tonight. Thank you very much. The, uh, you know, mingling with the voters. Okay, great. One more quick question before we, we break. Um, what, is, what do you think the legislature could do to help small businesses in Virginia? Well, thank you. I, th I think one of the, uh, the, the holy grail here is to, is to find a replacement for the bee pole tax. If you're not familiar with the bee pole tax, it requires that people who operate a business in Virginia pay a tax on their gross, uh, the gross of their business, whether they make a profit or not. Um, and we've been unable to figure out a way uh, to find a taxing structure that relieves small business of, of that uh, really unfair burden. Uh, the problem is if, if the bee pole tax is taken off, who's going to pick up the slack? And, and nobody wants to, uh, to uh, uh, step forward and, and, and take, that, uh, take that burden. Uh, the rest of things we can do for small business is solve things one at a time. Uh, I created a 500-barrel uh, a uh, uh, business license for brewers because the smallest one they could get was 10000 and it cost over $3,000 to get that license. Today, they can get it for about 1000 bucks for a realistic amount of beer that they might want to make. Little tweaks like that are what will help small businesses here in Fairfax County and the Commonwealth. Thank you.
Right, and that's a, a great question. And you know, the thing that I love about the 37th district is how many small businesses that, that we have, and they really are the backbone of, of our economy. Um, the tax structure certainly does have a lot to do with it. And so you've got BPOL. You also have the machinery and tools tax, which is a very outdated tax, and that it uh, taxes investment in things uh, that create revenue and, and, and create jobs. Uh, Senator Marsden also mentioned, you know, working specifically with individual uh, businesses. This, uh, you know, a couple uh, times ago, I worked with the yoga uh, studios in the area because they had something that was uh, impeding their ability uh, to go ahead and actually uh, have their business. We also, though, uh, really need to focus on, on how do we grow and diversify our economy in a way that supports small businesses. And so a great example that we had last year was that Solar Energy Development Authority that Delegate Hugo and I worked on. Um, and so this is a, a case where you have green energy technology. Um, it's spreading throughout the US. And the simple fact is Virginia wasn't getting ahead of the curve on that. And so we're going to be the beneficiary of that green energy, but we're not going to take advantage of those jobs, which by and large are a lot of small businesses. And so those are just a few things that we Time need to focus up. on. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd just like to really quickly address one of the questions that were asked earlier about voter turnout. Um, as Delegate Hugo mentioned, it's amazing how many times when I go door knocking, people are not aware it's an election year. Um, it's also amazing how many times, especially in the city of Fairfax where I live, there are people who have lived there for generations and they don't even know who their legislators are. And I think that's a huge concern. So one of the things I want to do to make sure if I'm elected and I think that we can help voter turnout is keeping people in the community engaged in the issues that are most important to all of us. Uh, keeping, keeping people interested in the issues are, is what's going to make sure people come out and pay attention and figure out who their legislators are, legislators are and how they're voting and come out to vote. Uh, in terms of the small business question, I come from a family of small business owners. My parents uh, have owned everything from delis to beer and wine stores to all sorts of stuff. And you know, one of the greatest things that happened to them was at a time when, in the early 80s, when they started their businesses, regulations were kind of looked upon in a common sense way. These days, excessive regulations and these tax structures are making it hard for our small businesses to grow. And we often wonder why our small Your businesses aren't growing. Up, so that's one of the things I would work on if elected. My great-grandfather, Foltz, started our family business in Hagerstown, Maryland. I was privileged to work with my great-aunt and my uncles and my aunt during the summers in college in Hagerstown. It's an industrial supply. It's still operating. But if they had this kind of tax there in Hagerstown on their gross receipts, they'd be out of business, bankrupt. Uh, I remember helping to prepare for inventory every fall, and that's when we didn't see my dad much because he was there late at night going through inventory, and they were taxed on that. Um, it's a business that... Um, May pays the bills, it's got a class A uh, credit rating, pays the employees, but doesn't make enough to really pay income tax as a business. So it's, it's an even operation. I can see uh, in terms of statistics that uh, the immigrant community produces more new businesses, more jobs than any other uh, you know, kind of a group of uh, business people. But when the larger businesses want to come into Virginia, they need to know that there's not going to be discrimination in terms of their employees, where they live, their credit. And I want to make sure that discrimination is controlled in Virginia. Thank you. Well, one thing I'd ask, let us know. A lot of you probably run businesses, or small businesses. We're up, the ones that are elected here and the ones that I want to be, we all sit on committees. I'm on Commerce and Labor, chair a committee on Commerce and Labor, does all the business and finance does tax. Over the years, we've had the businesses, small businesses come to me on the machinery and tools for the solar. We took, the, we took it off because it was stifling that emerging industry. We've had them take, we've had things where businesses were being over-regulated just trying to have meetings. It was ridiculous. It's the little things that a lot of times add up. That's why people come to you with ideas, oh Tim, we just want you to do this, business won't mind. Well, it's death of a thousand cuts for business. But also, we can roll that back. People come to me, the best ideas I get are from the community. People come and say, hey, Tim, this is a bad idea. Can you fix it? And we do, or we work on it, at least try. I would ask you, we've done this, and all of us here, the elected officials, are in the ability to try to roll back regulatory regulations or taxes, and we can do it to hurt business. Thank you very much. Ms. Boisco. When I was working for the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, I, I staffed um, the chairman of, of the Economic Advisory Commission. Um, and we worked with 50 of the businesses in Fairfax County to talk to, 
to talk to them, to hear from them, what would make Fairfax County policies work better for businesses. They pulled in folks from all over the area, small businesses, large businesses, people who work for the county, regular everyday citizens and, and nonprofits to get their input. Again, that's the most important thing we can do. But I think also, we need to have comprehensive tax reform in Virginia. It is an antiquated system. And we need to make sure that our, our transportation works, our education system works, so that people actually want to come and live in Virginia. I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have, is that we want people to want to live here and work here. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Uh, thanks. You, I already addressed the uh, B poll issue taxes and uh, some of the regulatory issues. I will say this: I was former chairman. I'm the former chairman of the Center for Innovative Technology, the Virginia Technology Authority, under both Governors Gilmore and Warner. And that was an era where we went around the state and we created tens of thousands of new, high-paying technology jobs from you know Fairfax County to Abingdon, South Side, Tidewater area. We really lifted the economy, and there were some common denominators that took place, but. Frankly, at the same time, there was government spending, and it really helped grow that tech economy. We can actually do the same thing again, and here's what's happening, and I want to share something with you. So CIT has this little incubator called Mach 37, which is in 90 days they're creating these cyber startups. Government's going to be spending money like drunken sailors on cyber. Here's the problem. The problem is not everybody gets to benefit from the same policies that Danny Vargas does as an 8A, where he gets unfettered access to contracts up to $3.5 million. If we make that available, and I can do that as a legislator, and I'll do that as a citizen who's fairly well connected with the procurement community, where every small business can get unfettered access to contracts worth up to $3.5 million, this economy will explode. Thank you very much. All right, I want to thank all of you candidates for participating this evening. It was a very interesting discussion, and I want to thank all of our co-sponsors, our volunteers, and you, the voters, for coming out tonight. Right now, we are allowing time for you to talk individually with the candidates about issues that are important to you. Thank you very much.